Hi, I'm Randy Cantrell. Welcome to the Year of the Peer podcast with Leo Batari. This podcast is based on a simple truth. Who you surround yourself with matters. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari will interview thought leaders from all walks of life who will share how they leverage peer advantage and show you how engaging your peers more purposefully can hold the key to greater success in business and in life. Today's guest is Lolly Daskal. Lolly is a best-selling author and one of the most sought-after executive leadership coaches in the world. Her extensive expertise spans 14 countries, six languages, and hundreds of companies. As founder and CEO of Lead From Within, her proprietary leadership program serves as a catalyst for leaders who want to enhance their performance and make a meaningful difference in their companies and in the world. Lolly's proprietary insights are the subject of her new book, The Leadership Gap. What Gets Between You and Your Greatness. Lolly was designated a Top 50 Leadership and Management Expert by Inc. Magazine, and Huffington Post honored her with the title of the most inspiring woman in the world. Lolly, welcome to the show. Lolly Daskal, welcome to Year of the Peer. So much a pleasure having you today. Great to be here. You know, it's great because Doug Sandler... Uh, from C-Suite Radio is the one that made the introduction. Of course, I've been following you for a long time, certainly on uh, social media and all, but we never really were able to uh, connect directly. And it was just great for him uh, to make that introduction. And, you know, as it turns out, this particular podcast will be the first that will be part of on C-Suite Radio. Um, so we're really excited to begin that partnership with C-Suite Radio and have you help us kick that off. So really cool. great. Congratulations. Oh, that's Congratulations fun. To be the first, and I hope <laughs> not the last. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, hey, I really would love to start out today by asking you, uh, you know, how did you get to be doing what you're doing today? Um, and who were some of the key influencers you had along the way? So that's a great question, Leo. So I'll, I'll answer the first one first. So how did I get started? You know, some people are, they, they're born and they go, I know what I want to be. But I wasn't one of those folks. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to be. But what I found was that I had a compassion towards serving others. And one of the things that makes me different, and I think what makes me really good at what I do, is that I'm really good at navigating through things instead of fixing things for people. And so what does that look like? It looks like I can ask a very compelling question or open-ended question, and it allows people to think for themselves and empower themselves in order to like fix a challenge or anything like that. And so when I first started out, I was teaching these workshops in actually in a, in a beautiful place in California, in Esalen. And there was an individual in my course who was in the workshop who said, you know, I have a question about business and I just want to know if you could help me. And I was listening to him and I kept asking him question after question. And at the end of our time together, our, it was actually over lunch. He said, wow, I feel so good talking to you. You know, would, would you ever consider working with me on a problems, on an ongoing problems? And that's how it started. You know, I fell into it. and. Because of him, I actually, he introduced me to so many other CEOs. And so that's how it happened. The second question was, who are my influencers? The reason I am, I think I'm really good at what I do is because I learned from three of my favorite mentors, I think how to be and how to conduct myself. The first one is Viktor Frankl. You know, when I read the, the book, The Man's Search of Meaning, my life changed. It was like with every challenge, you can find meaning and what happens in your life. And I found that to be extremely compelling. And I took that message very personally. The next one was Joseph Campbell, who taught me that in every part of our abyss, meaning every part of our challenges, there was always a treasure. And I found that to be extremely helpful, not only to me, but for those I was talking to. And then it was, you know, Carl Gustav Jung, who really taught me that within each of us, there is archetypes there are um there is like this persona that we have and that if we're not mindful of them like i like to translate it could either lead us to our gaps or to our greatness and these three men have really shaped my life in the way i think 
So I'd actually like to get your perspective because, so on one hand, you were kind of invited into this world, if you really think about it, right? Someone asked you a question and, and kind of, um, you know, invite you into this. And so talk a little bit about the value that you believe CEOs get from seeking outside leadership advice, whether that's from, you know, a, a coach like yourself or a peer group or whatever that looks like for them. Because as you know, those jobs can be um, very isolating. Uh, at times and where they don't always have people that they can confide in. So I'd love to get your perspective on that. Leo, that's such a great question. You see, sometimes a CEO might think they have to have all the answers. Sometimes they think they need to do it all by themselves. But the truth is at a certain level, it's very lonely. It's very isolating. Sometimes people won't tell you the truth. And so getting outside help or getting outside counsel or having someone, a trusted advisor, is imperative, I think, if someone's going to be successful at the level of a CEO. So, you know, one of the things I would love to do, of course, today, because you've got a new book uh, coming out in May, and I'm very excited about it. I had the opportunity, as you well know, thank you for that, uh, to review and read through the manuscript, and it was really exciting. Of course, it's the leadership gap what gets between you and your greatness? Of course, as I quickly went through the um, uh, table of contents, I thought to myself, if Jeffrey Chaucer were writing a leadership book, this is what that table of contents might look like, because you come up with some very powerful archetypes. And I guess I'd love to get a sense of how those came forward for you over the course of your career, working with as many CEOs as you have over time, when and how you started seeing these patterns and these archetypes develop. I love that question. That's a great, great question. You know, I've never been asked that before. So I, I would love to dive into that. So while coaching individuals, I found that there were characteristics that made people stand out and there were some that really held them back. And it started from there. It started like, I knew that if a CEO had confidence, then he would be a certain kind of CEO or she would be in a certain kind of CEO. And this is not gender that, you know, I'm only using he because for the sake of this conversation, but this belongs to both men and women equally. Um, I also found that some CEOs use intuition while others don't. Some have integrity, some don't. And some have loyalty, but some don't. And I started to notice what kind of person would have confidence and then I associated with a rebel. So it was a very organic form, but it also is what's really brilliant about this model is it is an acronym for rethink. Rethink are the seven archetypes. And why I love this, why I love it and why it works is because most CEOs and most organizations like acronyms and they, and this is almost like a shortcut. If you know that you need to excel, the question is, are you thinking too much of what you've always done or do you need to rethink? And the rethink is diving into those 11, uh, diving into those seven leadership archetypes to find out how you can excel. I mean, it's quite brilliant and I've seen it work over and over and over again in a really great way. So I will tell you, as I read through them, I probably identified most closely with the rebel um, but it, would it be fair to say that, um, as I felt I did, would most readers kind of see pieces of each of the archetypes in them at a certain level, or how do you, um, you know, parse that? Again, a really great question and actually a very important question, so I'm happy you asked that. One of the things that we've gotten very used to when we talk about leadership styles is that we're either one or another. And even when we talk about brands, when we talk about businesses, we can only be in one niche, but we can't be in another. And as Carl Gustav Jung taught me, we're the sum of all our parts. We can't separate ourselves. We're holistic people. We're the, we're, we have many parts to who we are. And so these seven archetypes are more situational than they are, I am the rebel or I am the knight. The truth is, at every, any given moment, we need to choose what archetype we're going to be. Sometimes we need to be the truth teller. Sometimes we need to be the rebel. Sometimes we need to be the explorer. It depends on the situation. That's who you need to be. You know, I thought that was especially important. You know, some of these stories in the book um, really kind of come down to a CEO who you have to convince that what has always worked for them in the past may not be applicable now 
right? right. <laughs> I mean, is there a particular story you'd like to share? And it doesn't even have to be from the book. Maybe it's, you know, we're going to give too much away. Maybe there's another story that you might think of as far as, you know, someone who, um, you know, was kind of relying on the way they've always done it. What has always worked for, for him or her when in fact um, something new was required now and trying to convince that CEO that in fact that was the case. Um, you know, I thought was was a really powerful part of um, several of your stories. So this is, uh, again, brilliant questions. I'm really <laughs> enjoying this because I think people are really going to relate to this question. So I don't, um, there is a version of this in the book, but the, I've seen in 30 years of coaching, I've seen this play over and over and over again. So let's say there's an individual that is really great at their competencies and at their capabilities, right? And I would call that a rebel. That's what they have. They have confidence in who they are. But sometimes when you elevate to being the CEO, we're not relying only on our competence and we're not only relying on our capabilities. What we need to find is the confidence within ourselves to be the leader. So what does that look like? So before when we were concentrating on best practices and processes and give me a procedure, when you're the CEO, you need to have confidence in who you are as a leader that you can empower others. Meaning, yes, the best practices are important and the processes are important, but what's more important now is the leader is the capability of connecting with others. It's, it's being able to um, engage others and empower others. And sometimes CEOs, when they become very successful, they go, no, it's all about my competence. It got me here. And I always say, it's not gonna keep you here because right now you need to pivot. Right now it's more about people than it is about yourself. And sometimes they have a very hard time with it. And PS, I always say, you're acting more like a manager than you're acting like a leader. And sometimes it's a little harsh, but I am the truth teller because your new position needs to be about the people and not so much about the process. You know, that uh, makes me think too, that when you were uh, thinking about who would write the foreword for this book, and of course, Marshall Goldsmith, um, as you know, talks famously about what got you here won't get you there. Was that in many respects something you had in mind? It's not certainly, it is a part of this story, not certainly the part of the story, but um, it, it certainly offers a perspective that I think um, where there's some shared alignment there. So love question, the great question again. <laughs> the thing is about Marshall, it is a part of the book. As we said, there's a bigger message in the book. But one of the parts is, is that you do have to, um, what got you here won't get you there. What I think is a bigger message in the book, and, and, and it was very important that Marshall should write that introduction because I thought it was a great segue into the book. But for me, the biggest message is, who are you being while you are leading? Which archetype are you? Because that is more important than the how, the what, the when, and the where. And, you know, Simon Sinek made why very famous. But I think if we're serious about leadership, it's really about who you are being that's very important, especially if you want to take yourself to the next level, especially if you want to be memorable, especially if you want to have impact. So, and these archetypes too made me think also of, so there's an aspect of this in addition to um, what got you here won't get you there, that too much of a good thing you know, at a certain level, right? <laughs> and um, I think the idea that with every one of these archetypes, you know, you, you, you go through them and, and yet what you realize is each one of them has an Achilles heel. Yeah. Each one of them has that gap that you have to understand and identify. And, um, and, and what I love is not only do you identify those gaps, but you really walk people through how to recognize them and what to do about them, um, which, which I loved. But so... Yeah, if you could talk to me about that a little bit and the importance of making sure that, A, how did you identify those gaps? And two, um, you know, the value and importance of making sure they were there so people recognized that, you know, there was, um, again, too much of a good thing is uh, not always positive. <laughs> yeah, so there's a, there's a good story in the beginning of the book about Michael, um, who we dubbed Michael, but that's not his real name. Um, who was a leader and he prided himself on being a truth teller. Everything about Michael was about telling the truth, telling the truth, telling the truth. 
And his board called me in and said, Lolly, you need to help this man. He is, he prides himself on telling the truth, but he's alienating people. And being a truth teller is a, I think it's standing in greatness. So when I started, when I met with Michael, I mean, he was a very impressive man, um, great businessman, great mind. But again, every, first, every sentence was about, and I always tell the truth, and I always tell the truth, and I expect people to always tell me the truth. And I was just listening to him. And after a while, I said, Michael, uh, can you tell me when you ever lied? And right. I thought he was going to bite my head off. And, and, <laughs> and he, he was very upset with me, I can tell. But then after a while, he said, you know, yeah, there has been a time that I lied. And I made a promise that if I wouldn't get in trouble because of that lie, I would never lie again. And I explained to him that carrying that burden of never lying again was creating a gap was making people not want to work with him, was alienating people from him. And that if he had to come to terms with, and read the book, what the story is about, because it's yes. a magnificent story. It is. It's a really good one. The truth is, is that he had to come to terms with what was he carrying, how visible it was to everyone, even though he was hiding it. And yet, once he came to terms with that he did lie, and it was okay, he was human, and not that I was forgiving him for the lie and not that it was right to lie, but it was okay to forgive himself. He like became unburdened and people really, you know, he kept telling me for weeks and weeks after, I feel so light. I feel so good, Lolly. What did you do? What did you do? I kind of unburdened him. Mm. I'm carrying the baggage of all that. He carried it for 47 years. This little lie that he told when he was 18 years old. Right. You know, it was a, it was an extraordinary story, um, and and I think to your point, the way he came across, although he regarded it as positive, really came across as sanctimonious, and really came across as uh, something that didn't invite others to share their truth with him at all. Probably, <laughs> you know, um, but uh, you know, it made me think about the flip side of that. So, you know, as a, a leadership coach. There's, on one hand, the responsibility of the leader that, to make sure that they create the environment where people will come to them and be, feel that it is absolutely their job. That's why they're there, is, is to tell them the truth. But for those key executives, not everyone, of course, is a CEO who's necessarily listened to this. It is the C-suite, but they um, are going to have to be challenged to uh, come to their CEO with the truth. And any advice you have about how to go about doing that for them, I think, would be really helpful. Absolutely. Well, Absolutely. And again, this is very important at any level. I think it's important that as a CEO to tell the truth. It's one thing to say, always tell the truth, always tell the truth. It's another to tell the truth, right? Michael was preaching. He wasn't doing it as much. He was like, you must tell me the truth. We must speak in truth. It, it was like, a li it became a little arrogant. Yeah. The thing is about what I believe about truth telling is that don't withhold information. Tell the truth. So let's say you're in sales. Let's say you have a business. Let's say you're the CEO. If something goes wrong, say that it's going wrong. Be that vulnerable. Be, I always say vulnerability is the newest strong because I really believe that if you share information, you invite people in, and then what happens is you, you get loyalty. You get people that understand you, people that resonate with you. People will realize when you withhold information and then what will happen is it will cause a gap. You'll mm -hmm. come across a deceiver and it will create suspicion. So the way to tell information is, I always say use heart, you know, um, be helpful, you know, be, um, be engaging, be authentic, be realistic and, you know, do the things that take tenacity. So what that means is be compelling but yet be informational. Like don't withhold, but be compassionate and show up with empathy. And when you do, I think it's a win-win. It's like, I don't think you get in trouble when you tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth laced with heart. <laughs> You know, it's funny when you think about, uh, when I think about truth and I think about kind of some associated words with that, one of them is integrity. And I remember as a kid uh, being taught that integrity is kind of like the example would be that if I were playing solitaire, you know, the, the idea that um, you would never cheat 
playing solitaire, even though no one would ever know, right, right. that I could do and do that. I think what I came to find as I got older, however, and worked with um, CEOs, it isn't so much about um, telling the truth when no one's looking. It's actually the tougher part is telling the truth when everybody's looking. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you really think about it, right, it's, it's will you actually openly apologize to someone if you're wrong in front of the whole world? Well, you might be perfectly fine to do that in private. It becomes a different matter when it becomes very public, doesn't it? Right. I believe, you know, it's interesting what you say. Um, I, think, I think we should do it when nobody's around and we should do it when everybody's around. It should become part of our DNA. So I like what you say and I agree with everything you're saying, but I like to be the person who I am when no one's looking and when people are watching. So I try to be cognizant of, both, you know, being the same. Ideal. Yeah, ideally. That's exactly, uh, you know. So what are some of the other um, key takeaways from the book that you'd really like people? In other words, if they're thinking, God, why do I need to read The Leadership Gap? Uh, what are some of the real outcomes and real benefits that you see for folks who, who pick up this book? Because like I said, um, I, I absolutely loved it. I went through it, you know, it was just storytelling was wonderful. The archetypes made sense. I, I found the, the advice incredibly valuable, but, um, uh, but yeah, but you wrote it. So I'd love to know some of what you uh, thought about when you were thinking about the outcomes. So in my years of coaching individuals, there comes a time for someone who feels that they want to take themselves to the next level and they just can't. There comes a time when people feel challenged by where they are. There comes a time when people get um, frustrated by who they're being. So for, any, for every single person that has ever wanted to make a difference, whoever wanted to leave a legacy, whoever's wanted to make an impact, I would like for everybody to know, and I think you can get this from this book, is that greatness is not a destiny that's only available for a few. It's a destiny that comes to those who choose greatness. So if you choose greatness, then learn the rethink model and ask yourself in every situation, am I standing in my greatness or am I leading from my gap? If you can do that before any conversation, any meeting, any encounter, trust me, your leadership will pivot into the kind of meaning and success that you've always wanted. So how can we help one another get there? You know, I, I don't think we're always socialized to say out loud that we seek greatness, right? <laughs> and, and oftentimes we're not always surrounded by people who um, invite that and encourage that um, in us. Um, any thoughts around that? You know, I don't think people say, you know, I want greatness. Greatness equals meaning. Greatness equals purpose. Greatness equals a better relationship, a deeper connection. And I think people want that at every level. People want to be recognized. People want to be appreciated and validated. That's what greatness gets you. That's what these seven archetypes get you. So I don't think people say, I want to be great or make America great. I think that's empty, right? What I think is purpose, meaning, connection, real connection, and so if that's what you're looking for, that's what this book can give you. And, is the, and was that the real inspiration for you to write it? I mean, this is not when I go through the book and see all of the research was done and all of the stories that you called over the years from CEOs. I mean, was that basically what inspired you to, to, to put this together and to know this was going to be an important book? You know, I'm going to be a truth teller here right now. So this is me speaking with full transparency and candor. Um, I had a proposal. I always wanted to write a book. I write 100 articles a month. I'm always writing. And I coach at a very high level. And so there's always interesting information. And so I had a proposal out with lots of publishing houses. And everybody wanted the proposal that I had out. There was one publishing house who said to me, Lolly, this is a great proposal, but there's something that you're not telling us. What have you been doing with CEOs all these years that you've never written about or you've never shared about? I go, oh, I do the rethink model. I created it over 30 years ago, and it's really great. And people have lots of success. And they go, we need that book. 
And so I signed up with Penguin Portfolio and that's the book. It wasn't my idea. I wasn't, I don't think I was smart enough to say, oh, I'm going to share what I've been doing. Because usually when you look at articles and you look at blogs and posts, everybody wants seven things of this and 12 things of this. But these leadership models have been, you know, put to use. They have been researched, they've been worked on, and they give you the success that you want. But I never thought about writing about it. Well, if that doesn't illustrate the power of asking the right question, I don't know what does, right? Um, actually, there was um, one of the um, archetypes that I wanted to um, ask you about, just because I had some personal interest in it, if you, if you don't mind. But um, I found it fascinating, and, and this, there's a few cases of this, but... So when, when I was looking at the explorer versus the inventor, for example, right? Some people might have brought that together into one archetype and you didn't. And there was very specific reason you didn't. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that because it's, I, I thought it was really, really fascinating because they could be, you know, you know what I mean? Closely related, I think. Uh, so let me say the difference between the explorer and the inventor. The explorer is someone who wants to look for new charted lands, new opportunities, right? So it's new opportunities, and the way they do it is by using their intuition. The gap side of that is the exploiter who manipulates. Why? Because when you use intuition, you go with your flow, you trust your gut, and when you don't, you want more control. You become a manipulator, you become micromanager. So that's one archetype. The inventor is more about a craft. It's how you do something. Remember, we talked it's situational, so it's one way to show up when you want a new idea. It's another way to show up when that new idea is, or it's about your craft. So how do you do things? With integrity, with excellence. How not to do it? To become a destroyer who is corrupt, who cuts corners, who says, let's do it faster, cheaper, and sooner. So there's a very big difference. One is about looking outward. One is about doing inward. Would you almost even characterize it as one about being more about creativity and the other about innovation, possibly? You could. That's a great way of putting it. But I, I think that um, an explorer is very creative. You, sometimes you need innovation to, to go to uncharted waters. But that's a good way of looking at it. That's interesting. I'm going to give that some thought. That's you know, uh, and I think largely because I remember – um, reading what I thought was the most succinct definition of um, innovation that I'd ever read. And it was just simply creativity realized, which I thought was like a fascinating way to think about, um, you know, that, that concept. And I guess as you were, you were talking about this idea of explorer and inventor, it, it, it kind of my head went there a little bit. So um, interesting. What I'd love, um, of course, two things. One is I'd love for people to know uh, when and where, they're going to be able to get the book. And then secondly, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about more about your practice and, and what you're doing. So people have a sense, I think of the fuller scope of what you're doing right now. So the thing about this is the book is in pre-launch right now, and I'm giving away something. Actually, it's a very important part. I'm giving away a free assessment. Usually that every CEO, every organization has to pay individually $97. But from now until when the book comes out May 30th, they can get, they can pre-order a book and they will get that assessment for free. What's amazing about the assessment, Leo, is that it's almost like a mini book that you can take with you anywhere that you want. It deep dives into the, into the archetypes. It lets you know which archetype you lean into. It's a, it's a brilliant piece of work. I actually, no, you know, the thing is, it's been in research for so long. Um, the folks who work with Susan Cain on Quiet work with me on my assessment. And it takes a lot of, it, it's a lot of work that goes into assessment because you wanted to, people to resonate with it. So the assessment is a great piece. So if you want to do that, it's a leadership, um, it's the leadership book. Oh my God, it's such a long URL, but this is the only thing that, <laughs> <laughs> the leadership gap book.com pre-order the book look at all the all the other gifts that i'm giving but the assessment is priceless then so that's very important um up until may 30th it's available um what am i up to and what do i do so i do many things <laughs> I'm, I'm the sum of many parts and so i coach um ceos fortune 500 I speak um, to, at events about leadership development and how to unleash greatness. 
My company's called Lead From Within, and I have been calling that for over 30 years. So I believe that every single individual can be a leader. It doesn't matter what level they're at. And um, I am most passionate about this book, this book, I'm giving birth to this book, and um, I'm really passionate about it. And I would love if every single person listening on your podcast would get the book and actually find me on social media. Let me know what you think. Connect with me. I'm very visible on social media, Twitter, LinkedIn. Talk to me about the archetypes. Tell me which one you lean into. Ask me your questions. I'm here, available, and wanting to connect. Now, that's really wonderful. And I have to tell you, I so I, I think I wrote you when I went through the first 50 pages, and then I actually had to run out. And I was a little bummed, I was said, because I didn't want to, you know, get away from it. And then I come back a couple of hours later, uh, went through the rest of it, really couldn't put it down. Like I said, one story to the next, um, I found really um, connected. They were just the stories were just so nicely told and yet so relevant. But I also loved, you know, the way, I mean, I just really had important takeaways from every single chapter. And I would absolutely encourage, you know, any of our listeners here. And I, I know that um, when it's available, um, I'll write something on amazon.com, probably on my own blog post and LinkedIn as well and encourage people because it's one of the best books I've read uh, in a while. And I just want to thank you for, for sharing that. Thank you for writing it. And, um, Thanks for being on the podcast today. We just really loved having you. Leo, this was amazing. You, have, you asked great questions, so thank you. Oh, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. To learn more about Peer Advantage, to submit questions to Leo and our guest, and to subscribe to the Year of the Peer podcast, please visit us at leobatari.com. It's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y.com. This podcast is produced by me, Randy Cantro, hosted, of course, by Leo Batari. Music provided by Kevin McLeod, Vibe Ace, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. <laughs>